Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to present here to you today. Um, so I'm here today with my urban planning hat on, and to me, urban planning, and we've heard from some of the speakers already today, to me, really good urban planning is about put, putting the citizen at the heart of what we do, and at the heart of what we do within our cities. And to do that, we really need really good data. So what I'm going to talk to you about is going right back to basics. What is a city? What makes a city smart? And what are smart cities? Some examples of global smart cities, and then what we are doing in smart cities and the work that we are continuously doing throughout Europe and beyond. Um, so these are a selection of cities across the world, primarily Europe and North America. And I don't know if you know, notice anything in particular about these cities that I put up here. There's a, there's a, a very simple pattern that has emerged from these um, footprints, if you want to call it that. If you look at the European cities, these are very organic. So you can see this, this street structure is very organic, and they've grown out of people, so how people use spaces, how we walk originally, then how we use horse and cart, so the, the, the desire patterns of movement has led to the involvement of our cities in Europe. If you look at the North American perspective, you'll see they're very structured. They're very grid-based. And again, the reason for that is they have put at the center of their design of cities as vehicles, the car, the bus, whatever. If you were to pan out from those European cities, you'd actually see that we're moving to more, much more grid structure so we're actually losing that fabric, that urban fabric that we all know and love so well within our European cities to the domination of movement of cars and vehicles, which I think is a bad thing. We need that organic, urban form, again, for quality of life to put a citizen at the heart of our cities. So that's, just, that's an interesting perspective to kind of bear in mind. So again, what is a city? The, the uh, old age debate about what really makes a city, what are the ingredients of a city? So it's about human settlement, it serves as a center of population, and um, again, generally has, can, can have its own local government, so it's, it's, it's autonomous in that sense. Um, it's looking at maintaining and providing utilities and transportation. And again, a phrase that comes to mind here is about critical mass. And critical mass is about the level of population that needs to be served and the services and facilities that we need to produce to have to serve that critical mass. And again, the characteristics of a city, its size, its population, exercise of power, its status, diversity, its connectedness, centralized specializations, levels of trade. So if you consider the great cities of the world, these are all really strong characteristics that come to the fore in these cities. Interesting to understand how we define a city, okay, and this is coming from the European Commission back in 2012. So they look at these cells, these one kilometer square cells, high density of 1,500 inhabitants per square kilometer. They look at them being contiguous, so connected, with a, leading to a population of greater than 50,000. And then the metropolitan area of the city is this wider spatial context with the city center then hosting over 50% of the population. And again, if you take Dublin, for example, our city centre, our urban core, has a population of approximately 550,000 people. The, 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 the Dublin county and city has a population in around 1.2, 1.3 million. But if you were to take the wider GDA, OK, that's the greater Dublin area, that has a population of 1.9 million. So again, this definition of the, from the European Commission really kind of sits home with how the city is spreading out its influence, its critical mass, its level of services that we need to provide for that. So what is a smart city? Again, and we've heard this from previous speakers about technology, it's about you know, sustainable resource management, tackling urbanization. And I noticed from the, 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 the kind of context of our afternoon, we've used this word cities and sustainability. I actually think we should be putting another word there, it's about city sustainability and resilience. Resilience has come to the fore so much. We even have resilience officers now in our cities. And what is resilience? Well, everyone has different definitions of resilience, but to me, 
It's about resilience. It's about being able to adapt and absorb, but not necessarily about bouncing back to where you were. It's actually bouncing forward to go to where you want to go to, much more productive, much more uh, important, much more fo fo forward thinking. So again, ICT connectivity is central, and we're looking at mobility, the environment, government, services, community. And all of these have massive impacts in our day-to-day -day operation. Everything from mixed modal transportation, pollution control, provision of infrastructure, urban planning, economic investment, renewable energy sources, again, energy management, safety, livability, public space, participation. This is where the really the community comes into play here, and they have a massive impact on this. And data, our previous speaker was talking about data. Data is so important. It's essential. So what makes a city smart? Effectively, it's data and connecting that, connecting that data and using that information. You mean real-time data, predictive analysis, data information, big data, Internet of Things, open data, sharing, and insights. And again, this leads to informed decision-making. So we're trying to learn all the time to do things better, become more resilient, bouncing forward. And some examples, and again, we've touched on some of these in our previous speakers. Barcelona, huge uh, influence and um, uh, experience from their whole mobility strategy, mobility programming. Waste, all the uh, uh, influences of waste management, street lights, sensor information, energy saving, parking. Again, look at it. If you go to the wider uh, context of Barcelona, it's a very grid-based system, again, because of putting the vehicles at the heart of it. Looking at Singapore, again, we touched on this earlier, use of public information, sharing of information, again, e-mobility, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles, smart planning, again, the citizen engagement in this is huge. They have so much to play in this. And the final one, looking at Palo Alto, and you, you asked uh, an example of a previous, of a, of a city, sort of the previous speaker, I think Palo Alto is really leading the way. It's a small city, Western uh, America, and I think this is at the forefront of where we should be going to in our smart city thinking. Again, citizen, they put the citizen at the heart of this, capturing information from the citizens that they're willing to share. Looking at the environment, looking at the connectedness, and again, looking at ICT, smart knowledge, mobility. And I think this is a really leading example. How cities are changing. Again, there's huge issues with cities at the moment. Huge migration issues, and trying to integrate that into our indigenous population. Issues of density, urban sprawl, transport and congestion, pollution, many, many social issues, again, that we're trying to tackle. So what are we looking for? We're looking for a healthier, happier, balanced local life. Again, this work-life balance. We're looking for com complete communities, attractive, safe, you know, places where we can live, work, and enjoy our spaces much more. These are the things we're looking for. How can we get there? This is really putting on my urban planning hat now. We need inclusionary zonings. And what I mean by that is we don't need huge tracts of land zoned for residential, huge tracts of land zoned for industrial, commercial. We need more inclusionary planning. You know, mixed use, mixed housing types. We need revitalization as opposed to erasure. We need to look at pocket parks and gardens, clean transport, and again, it comes back to my old friend here, public participation. And again, information, data is key. So how cities are changing again, we need to develop innovative solutions, test and deploy, monitor and evaluate, improve and become more efficient in our decision making. And it's important to upskill people, you know what I mean? Are, are, are the the, 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 the um, ability of people in today's working environment is massive. They have huge knowledge base, but they need upskilling. They need to develop and maintain that intelligence. And again, the public-private sector collaboration is central. So one of the projects that we are working on is called Plus City Exchange. You can actually look at this. on um, it, We have our own website. This was funded by the, by the European Commission under the Lighthouse City Program. We started this project last November. It's a five-year project. Um, from cities uh, uh, all over Europe. Um, and what we're looking at is looking at co-creating 
cities that we want, all want to live in. So we have two lighthouse cities, we have Limerick and we have Trondheim in Norway, and then we have five follower cities. So basically the follower cities, through replication, upskilling, and uh, uh, knowledge sharing, are going to follow, that's what I call the follower cities, they're going to follow what the lighthouse cities are doing in their uh, development of their, say, um, building positive energy blocks, e-mobility, etc. Um, so what we're looking at is to reduce and manage, looking at really resource uh, uh, environment management, clean mobility, creating these positive energy blocks and districts, and again, looking at smart ICT, and again, citizen engagement. So looking at Limerick, for example, there's key projects and key data within that. So looking at, again, looking at reducing the energy consumption, looking at solar PV, hydro, shared mobility, community buy-in, and again, we need key information to actually develop and enhance these, these projects. What we're doing in this, us as in Future Analysis Consulting, we're involved in the, actually the monitoring and evaluation of the KPIs. So we have 33 KPIs in this project, so we're involved in managing, collecting that information from the, the data providers, data owners, seeing as that information having an impact, are they reaching their KPI target, and we have to report on this every six months to the European Commission. They have their own special smart city website, so we have to report on that, are these KPIs being met? So to do that, we've had to develop our own monitoring and evaluation platform, dashboard, that is going to capture the data, manage the data, calculate the KPIs, re give really good visualization results, so the actual citizen can link into this and see actually the impact that these KPIs are having on their daily life in these lighthouse cities and then the follower cities. And then obviously share the information, share the data with them, so everyone can get real buy-in from it and, and continuously reproduce, replicate and upscale. So the next steps for smart cities, and particularly for the success of our Plus City Exchange and the Limerick project, again, community engagement, citizen mapping urban footpaths, engaging with the cities and the SMEs, uh, looking at doing things together initiatives, and again, the implementation of ongoing requirements and actions. And one of the key things that have come out of our Smart Cities project is this bold city vision. And that's about being bold. It's about putting out something there that's new, innovative, that is challenging. You might not actually fully achieve your vision, but it's a bold one that you're trying to achieve. And that's really, that's really key. And again, promoting innovation. And finally, we need ongoing collection, collation, analysis of the data. And adapting to the changing needs of the people, of the footprints, really to get public buy-in. Thank you very much. And um, I just about dried out. Just about dried out. <laughs> just about. That was, that, was, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. And thank you for asking or answering my question. Um, that means I can't ask you well, again. You, no, you can't, you can't ask the next one now. He's already, he's already answered it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get you with a quick question. Just uh, maybe what, what, are, what do you feel is the biggest challenge right now for a city like Dublin going forward? Um, in the immediate future to tackle? Is it something like transport? Do you think it's energy? Yeah. Just a quick... I, I think because of where we've come from, we're on the edge of, obviously, Europe, mm. and we've been heavily influenced by uh, North America. Mm. So we have this big issue at the moment with density. That's our biggest issue. We're, on, we're, we're, on, we're in this balance at the moment. We're, we're ready. The young, energetic, working people of Ireland, and Dublin in particular, they need density, they want to live in the city centre, they want to be connected, they don't want to rely on cars and all this, where the older fogies like myself, you know, they, they're saying, oh, we need our three bed, four bed, front back gardens, a car parking space. Mm -hmm. so, we're, so we need to move into this more densification, but densification doesn't mean a drop in quality of life. It can mm -hmm. actually mean better quality of life if it's properly planned and integrated into our city planning. So I think that is our biggest issue, catering for densification, and also mixed-use development. Great, well, well, thank William again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.